Thanks. Thanks, Ian. Okay. Can everybody hear me all right? Yep. Excellent. Excellent. Right. Um, just a little bit before I start the presentation, just to explain uh, what I do. I work for London Borough Lambeth in the Parks Department. So we've got places like Brockwell Park, Norwood Park, West Norwood Cemetery, Clapham Common and parks and places in between. And the reason why I'm doing this talk is that as well as being a parks officer, I happen to be the borough ecologist, uh, wherever hat that is. Uh, but also my background is I did my PhD in small mammals. So it's something that I've been doing since uh, probably my 20s. And I just have a general fascination for small furry mammals because they're just smaller versions of us. Okay, so um, I'll, if everybody's all right now, shall I share the screen and I'll start, all right? So I'm just gonna make sure everything's ready and off I go. So just give me a second. I'm just gonna get everything ready. Right, and off we go, okay. Okay, and let's get that up to the screen. Okay. Can everybody see that all right? Looks good. Yeah. Is it showing as a full screen thing? It is for me. Yep, yeah. full screen. No, no, no criticisms yet, good, that's what I like to see. Okay, um, I'll start now, it's just a little bit, it's, it's title really is, it's about um, the big world of small mammals of discovery. So I'm not gonna go into like every single mammal in Britain because that would be exhaustive and be here all day, night. Uh, it's just some of the key small mammals that we might find in a place like Lambeth. Um, there are exceptions to prove the rule and there are many alien species that have arrived in this country. Uh, I'll touch on some of them later on, but. The, the, the spectrum is huge across the United Kingdom. Okay, so a um, bit of info about me. I work for Lambeth, uh, Parks and Spaces and the Borough Ecologist. It's a small talk on wild small mammals, the small furries, as you can think, that occupy our urban environment. Love them or hate them. Uh, they're coming along for the ride with us and they'll be with us for a lot longer than we will be around because they're tough creatures and they're very adaptive. So an example's there. You've got an example there of a, a house mouse and on the right hand side you've got a hedgehog. Okay, so first is what small mammal? Well, it, I think it says it as it is. It's essentially a very small version of ourselves. Like mammals are us, they're warm-blooded. They give birth to live young. Uh, their bodies are covered with a dense hair or fur. They have binocular vision, so two ears, so the uh, versions of um, right there you oh sorry ian i think sorry. we might have lost you a little bit there sorry that might have broken down should i just go through that again yeah i can hear you again now yeah sorry there's a bit connected internet connection stability popping up okay just to again uh, it's a small mammal it says it as it is it's a small version of ourselves uh, dense hair, fur, vision, etc. Uh, right hand, left hand side is a vole, right hand side is a red squirrel. Okay. Okay. Oh, God, what's happened there? Sorry about this. Just going again. Is that going all right? It seems to have stuck again. I can hear you, but the, um, the PowerPoint's still on the same image. Right, it seems to have blocked. Try it again. Okay, there we are. Um, a small mammal, uh, it's difficult to give an exact cutoff for what I mean by a small mammal. Um, the usual one they use is, it says it's about one kilogram as an adult, less than one kilogram. That means things like hedgehogs, stoats, weasels, mice, voles, moles, shrews, squirrels, and bats. So roughly one kilogram when they're adult size, anything bigger than that, you're probably getting into the realms of a medium sized or the big mammal. The one thing that's true of them, they're very varied in their lifestyles, ecology, and what they eat. Uh, and some are relatively domesticated and live with us, 
uh, often in our gardens as well as in our homes. Um, others avoid human contact at all costs. Uh, at the top there, you've got a, a harvest mouse, a very small, small mammal, um, but very, you know, found in fields and, and uh, hay fields and arable fields. On the bottom there, the one example of a small mammal is the mole, who does try to avoid contact with us, although, of course, those who've got moles in their garden will know they'll come right up to where we live, but they do try to avoid us normally. Why do they matter to us then? Well, I think we've got a very long intimate relationship with wild swarm mammals. Um, they've coexisted with us and sometimes they've come into conflict with us for millennia, if not longer. Um, they've been around with us as long as we have, if not longer. They also, of course, we know about a lot of small mammals, they can have significant economic, health and environmental impacts upon our so-called cozy lifestyles. Uh, there are many, um, you know, huge kind of catastrophic incidents have been caused by mammals that have invaded into our world and spread things like disease and cause huge economic damage to crops. Uh, what the, the other thing that's interesting about them is what hurts them might often hurt us. Uh, they might give us some early warning if things are going to get nasty for mammals in general. So things like climate change, pollution, disease, if they're going to fall first, we as humans might be the next to fall and they can give us some early warning that things aren't happy in the world. Uh, hedgehogs are a good example where, you know, their numbers are declining. Is that because of factors which we're causing or things going on? And other predators like weasels, um, if they start disappearing, that suggests their food supply is being shut down, which means there's something happening in, this, in the world of mammals. The other thing about them is they, small mammals live life on the edge. Um, they usually have relatively short lifespans. Uh, quite a lot of them are less than a year, if they're lucky. Uh, they have a very high mortality because of that. They get eaten by a lot of things and they get crushed by everything and the cold weather gets them. But they have a very high fecundity and reproductive rates. At the top there is a, is a picture of a of a colony of house mice. And those of you who've ever seen pictures on the telly about you know, plagues of house mice will know they'll breed huge numbers of pups and they can literally overwhelm a property if they have enough food and shelter. So they breed fast and produce lots. They have what's called the boom and bust model in that they can go through population booms and then when food runs out, everything crashes down again. The classic example on the bottom there is a Norwegian lemming. You've all heard of the story of the lemmings and everybody says lemmings jump off cliffs into rivers, uh, suicidal, it's not true. Lemmings boom their numbers when the food's good and when things run out, they all start to disperse and if the river's in the way, they'll fall in the river. So they don't do suicide runs, they just literally run out of space and the river gets in the way. They can really exploit and colonize if there's enough food, shelter, and if there's limited predation pressure. So if the pressure's off, they can just boom their numbers. But when the food runs out or there's disease, predators, weather, they go through these population crashes. Uh, and the cycle can keep repeating and the Norwegian lemmings is the case point. They are tough little critters. Um, they have high population turnover and high reproduction rates. And that makes them incredibly adaptive to a changing environment. So they can exploit new opportunities to survive. Um, we know a lot of small mammals can rapidly acquire resistance to disease, to parasites, to pesticides, climate change and pollution. The classic one, of course, is house mice. If you put enough rat poison and mouse poison down, they'll usually build resistance and uh, they'll beat you in the game. In the game. Wild rodents also, of course, um, we know for a good example of that one, they were some of the first animals to colonize the exclusion zone at Chernobyl. When they did some of the surveys, went back to the Chernobyl exclusion zone, small mammals were the first back. Um, then of course, the bigger animals came. Um, and the proof of that in the top there are some bang voles, picture taken from Chernobyl, and underneath there is a long-eared owl in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. So the owls come because of course the food is there because the owls live off the small rodents. So, you know, they are very adaptive to changing environments. So who are our main small mammals in the UK? Well, we've got what we call insectivores. So in the top left, right, left there, you've got a shrew. 
Uh, they eat insects or invertebrates or hedgehogs, moles, shrews, bats. They prefer invertebrates. Then you've got the rodents or things like uh, the gnawing teeth, uh, small mammals, your rats, your mice, dormice, squirrels. Carnivores, they're the meat eaters. Storks and weasels are the good examples. And then what's called the legomorphs, I'll explain what they are. There's the hare and the rabbits. So hares and rabbits, legomorphs, big floppy ears, big back legs, um, typical shape of a rabbit or a hare. Let's go on to give you some examples of what we've got. Um, insectivores are the insect eaters. It's not true, they eat more than just insects, slugs and everything. They tend to be relatively primitive small mammals, um, biologically speaking. So they're quite basic in how they're made or constructed. What really gives them away is they've got sharp cutting or slicing teeth. If on the top there, you can see there's a, a, a skull from a shrew. And if you look at those teeth, they're sharp, tough, robust little teeth designed to crush up and chew um, hard, you know, animals like insects and crushing through the, uh, the shells of insects or, you know, slicing through the tissues of a slug. Um, they're also close teeth, so they don't grow continuously through life, uh, uh, just like our teeth. Um, they fall out and they can wear away, uh, in some cases, they're replaced. So, you know, they're not continually growing. They have a finite life, their teeth, but they're very tough and sharp. At the top right hand there, there's a picture of a small hedgehog who's being picked up and you can see the sharp teeth in the hedgehog's mouth. Uh, it's one of the good reasons why you've got to be careful. If you provoke a hedgehog, it will give you a nasty nip. And shrews are notorious for giving you a really nasty bite, a nip. They are quite sharp toothed. They do tend to have very poor eyesight. It's variable. They have small little eyes. And of course, the classic example is the mole. You know, moles aren't truly blind, but their eyesight is so poor and so small, they rely on sense of smell. Um, and of course, touch and hearing. Bats, uh, you know, um, the classic example who use hearing. Eyesight's not very well developed. They tend to be quite solitary, um, unless of course they need to find a mate. Um, there are some wonderful pictures on the web of shrews squabbling, uh, and even when they're trying to mate, they still squabble. They are very solitary. They don't tend to like being in group, big groups. They live solitary, and then they come together to breed. Um, so insectivores, they're everywhere. The shrews, the moles, the hedgehogs. They tend to like nice crunchy insects or nice juicy slugs and snails. So they're all around us. So we've got things like shrews, um, velvety fur, small eyes, pointed snouts, the voracious predators, they will take anything bigger than them. They are quite feisty. Worms, slugs, bugs, and insects. In the top, the left-hand side, you've got a, a common shrew, little pointy nose, you can see it. On the right, there's a water shrew. They live in near water and they can swim as well as find water, uh, food on the, on the surface. They'll actually jump into a water body and they'll swim. They've got little hairy feet, used like paddles. Uh, the moles, of course, um, those who've got big gardens will curse them all, but they are there in London. Dark velvety fur, powerful digging arms. That one on the left hand side bottom, you can see the really powerful front uh, limbs modified into like spades to dig. Um, avid burrowers, they'll take earthworms, but they'll do leather jackets, beetles, um, very, very fascinating creatures and grubs. Other insect eaters, of course, the famous insect eaters, and I've done a talk about this before, are bats, true flying mammals with wings, highly modified ears, noses and mouths are all modified for sound. They find insects by using ultrasonic sounds, what are called echolocation. So they'll use a kind of modified radar to find their food. And then of course, in the bottom there, you've got an, an, a, an insectivore is in quite crisis at the moment, and that's the hedgehog spiny court, which is actually modified hairs. They love to predate on slugs and snails and earthworms. Uh, and of course, you'll find them in some gardens, but sadly, not a lot anymore. Um, you know, very famous insect eater. But how common are they in, in London? Well, they're very variable where you'll find them in what numbers. Um, shrews are relatively common in the rural and some rural areas of London. But we do find them in inner London, in parks and open spaces where there's good cover vegetation and low disturbance. Um, I think we've had records in places like Brockwell Park, 
and Norwood Park in Westfield Cemetery. Um, malls uh, don't get a lot in Lambeth. Uh, they're more the kind of outer edges of uh, London where there's more pasture and parkland. But of course, the big giveaway is the mole hills scattered across the park and the garden. They seem to like road verges as well until they reach the edge of the verge and then they realise they've hit a road and then they go back again and find something else. So look out for malls in London. They're, they're mainly on the outer edges of London, but they do exist. Bats, of course, we know bat numbers are quite variable across London. Some places they're quite hot. Uh, we've got lots of small bats in Lambeth, good records throughout our borough, but the bigger bats are found in the south and the less built up areas. So we've got the smaller bats, but the bigger bats tend to be scattered out towards the edges of the bigger outer London boroughs. Hedgehogs, uh, very restricted distribution now. We do get them in Lambeth. Um, but there's some hot spots, particularly around Brockwell Park and around West Norwood and Streatham. Uh, but I think a lot of that's just due to the recording returns. People just are not giving us accurate figures of where they are. They do exist. Um, so there's some pictures there of a hedgehog and some bats in a colony and bats living in a, in a, in a roof attic. So insectivores like shrews and hedgehogs and moles, they do exist in London, but the records are quite variable. There's an example from uh, London Wildlife Trust's um, uh, London Hedgehog record, and you can see the pins show where people have recorded hedgehogs in London. Central London is obviously big, big void, but you can see the pins show that, you know, London does have a lot of hedgehog records. But as you drill down in this map, you'll see there are big gaps, even in London boroughs, where there's just not enough recording. Um, so if you do have hedgehogs in your garden or where you live, please do Google London Wildlife Trust Hedgehog and get a pin down where you think they are. The more we know about them, the more we can help them. So hedgehogs are a good example of an insectivore that needs our help. Now on to the uh, other small mammals that everybody sort of either loves or hates, and that's rodents. Uh, they are gnawers and nibblers. They're an astonishingly huge group found across the entire globe. I mean, the number of species of rodents is phenomenal. They love dense black, brown, red, 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 red fur. Tails can be variable. Sometimes they can be naked, furry or hairy, long or short. Um, some rodents have prehensile tails. They can use them to cling on to stems. And the, um, the, the harvest mouse is a really good example. They've got prominent eyes, little black, dark eyes. The ears can vary, long or small. Uh, lovely big prominent whiskers, because they obviously use the whiskers to sense their environment. And their diet is incredibly varied. I mean, astonishingly varied. Um, you know, they'll eat anything and they're quite omnivorous. So the top there, you've got a, a brown rat, uh, the common rat, and down there is a, is, a, is a hare, sort of a rawden, but it's now put into its own group. The one thing that gives them away is their teeth. And that's, I've got some samples of uh, teeth. I just kept these from my PhD. You can see a rawden skull there. And if you look at the front, you can see the big incisors. We've got them in our mouths. So they're kind of like the, the, the front teeth in our jaw, which we use to slice or grip food. And the rawdens, they use them to gnaw and to slice and to chop up. They're at the front of the mouth, a pair, top and bottom. They're very sharp and they're constantly being replenished with the cutting edges. If you look at a rawden's uh, from teeth, they're continually growing from the skull and from the jaw. It's constant through their lives. Whereas the front of the tooth is worn away, the uh, the back grows forward to replace it, because they're living on a really hard, gritty, um, tough di uh, diet. So they need to keep replacing their teeth in order to keep chewing up their food. And the bottom there, you can see a picture of a of a, a rat, obviously yawning, and you can see those splendid incisors. Um, if you ever get bitten by a rat or a mouse, you'll know it certainly hurts because they have a habit of going for your knuckles and it really, really hurts. Um, good idea not to put your finger uh, in, a, in, a, in the face of an irate mouse. They are versatile and ubiquitous rodents, mice and rats. We've got in, New, in London, certainly, we have brown or the common rats. It's the rat that everybody finds in their sewers and in the gardens or in food piles and compost heaps. The black rat is the one that's increasingly rare, and that's the one that used to be called the ship rat. Uh, and I'll talk about that later. 
and that's on the left hand side and of course our favorite friend the house mouse um, the small mouse we found everywhere but we do have some other nicer rodents or interesting rodents in london um, the wood of the field mouse the top right hand side there that's a wood mouse or a field mouse they tend to like arable areas but they might don't mind hedges and and gardens the bottom there, uh, I've got the yellow neck mice, but there's a little harvest mouse on the left hand bottom. Uh, of course, they tend to find themselves in fields of cereals uh, and they do get them on the edges of London. The hazel dormouse, I'll come on to later, that's the, um, the common dormouse, the one of course in um, Alice in Wonderland, the one that's asleep all the time. But there's another dormouse that you get on the very periphery of London called the fat dormouse or the edible dormouse, which is a non-native that was introduced into Hertfordshire. Uh, I think it was introduced into Tring, uh, and it's, that's the home of the, the Rothschilds, of course, very famous um, they're naturalists. Um, but we don't get a lot of them in Lambeth, I don't have any records, but they're certainly on, on the edge pushing their way in. Um, the other one that I always like to mention because I've studied them, the voles. Um, those are some pictures of some voles. They are rodents, but you notice they're a bit stubbier, little stubby noses, small ears, and they tend to be grass and grain eaters. So you've got the field vole, which loves grasses found in fields, bang voles, top right hand side, um, likes hedges and eats quite grain as well as grass. And the one that everybody forgets to think about is the water bull, Ratty from Wind in the Willows, who's the water rat who likes living next to rivers and streams and is increasingly rare in London now, very, very declining in its numbers across the whole of London and the UK and pushed to the very edge of its habitat. So voles, don't forget the voles. And of course, the other rodents um, we forget, or probably try not to try to forget, but we can't, are squirrels. Um, rodents with long fairy tails, mainly seed, nut and bark eaters, often sit upright, very good arborealists, so they love climbing trees. The red squirrel is on the right, the native, and the grey squirrel is on the left, which is an introduction from North America, and it's the one we see a lot of in London. But red squirrels, of course, there are populations across the UK, uh, mainly um, isolated from the greys. How common are they? Well, in London, um, the rodents are, depends on the species, location, and site management. Uh, hazel dormouse are the really rarities. They're found on the very edges of outer London, Barnet, places like Enfield, Bromley, um, Hillingdon. They tend to like coppice woodlands because they'll move between the coppice trees. And so we don't have a lot of them in central London. So it's those big open, Berries on the edge of London where you will find colonies of hazel dormice. The harvest mice, they're declining because of course we just don't have those big meadows that we used to have in the edges of London, the big hay meadows and cereal meadows. And on the right hand side there you've got a, a little harvest mouse and you can see his tail wrapped around the stem of the, of, the, of the cereal using it to get an anchor while it climbs from stem to stem. So they're disappearing, they're not as common as they used to be. Wood mice and yellow net mice, the yellow net mice is a relative of the wood mice, they are associated with woodlands, hedges, and young woodland plantations. And we certainly get them in Lambeth. Um, we've had records of them uh, in the south of the borough. How common are, are field voles? Well, field voles are either love a lovely rough, tusky grassland. Uh, so where there's lots of like rough grass, then they do well. Um, we've had records of them in some of our parks and open spaces. Uh, the biggest giveaway is predatory birds like owls and kestrels. They love field voles. So if you see a kestrel hovering above a field, there's a good chance there's a field vole in that, in that grassland. And I think we've had a record or two of them in Brockwell Park. So they are certainly there. Bang voles, they like hedges, uh, field margins and woodlands. Uh, we do them we do quite well in London's gardens as well. They're very cosmopolitan. The water ball is the sad one. The water ball is really declined in, 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 in huge numbers. Uh, habitat loss, as we've lost a lot of these kind of wetland habitats that we like. But there's also been a problem with predation by American mink introduced as a species for producing fur, escaped from their farms, and of course has gone wild. And it seems to really, really predate on the water balls. Then numbers decline. 94% of water balls disappear across the UK and they're in serious trouble and there's a lot of projects to try and reintroduce them but 
that means we've got to try and control the American mink as well. So on the right hand side there, there's a there's a field vault on uh, one of my friend's arms uh, in, a, in a, a open space in Croydon, and you can see they're quite a chunky little thing. It's quite a nice meal for a bird of prey. You imagine an owl or a or a kestrel or a sparrowhawk. That's a nice chunky meal. So they are very important as a source of food for our birds of prey. As for our friends, the brown rats and the house mice, uh, don't ask, I think you all know that they're very common and very successful, highly adaptive, but they become a major pest and a nuisance across all the London boroughs. On the left hand side, there is a mouse uh, demolishing a meal of a power cable. Uh, and those of you who've ever had a mouse problem will know they'll, they'll, they'll try and chew anything. They're doing it, of course, to keep their teeth nice and sharp. Um, so they're working their teeth on a nice piece of plastic to keep it nice and sharp so they can chew the grain and the food. Great reproduction rate, very agile. They'll get to the smallest gaps and voids. But there's also now a lot of concern that uh, rats and mice are resistant to rodenticides, rat poisons, because again, you know, um, their breeding rate means they acquire immunity very quickly. Um, this is one of the reasons why there's concerns about just chucking rat poison everywhere. You're just going to breed a super rat or a super mouse who can withstand anything you throw at it. The best solution is to have lots of predators, cats, birds of prey, foxes, something that will take them out of the system. The, what I'm going to mention, interestingly, is the black rat, uh, the ship rat. Um, it's thought to be, because it's very famous, you go back in history, the black rat was thought to be one of the major vectors for bubonic plague in the Black Death in the 14th century. These rats found commonly on ships brought into the docks of London and Europe, and of course they brought the bubonic plague uh, with them in the fleas. Um, there's a lot of contention about whether they were the sole cause of it, but they seem to be in a strong association. They're once common across London, especially in places like the docks and the riverside housing. You know, you see a lot of the old stories going back to Victorians of the black rats everywhere. But they're now quite rare in London. Uh, they're almost an endangered species, as of course, places like Docklands have been lost and those kind of like poor quality slum housing, uh, the black rat numbers have crashed. And there's now very, very rare to find them in good numbers in London, but they do exist. But if you see any, let us know. Hares and rabbits are called eagles. Um, they're like a separate group now, um, but they are obviously quite fearless. Uh, they've got prominent incisors, gnawing teeth. They're gnawing plant-eating mammals. Originally an order of the rodents, but now they've been given their own order. Of course, like rats and mice, they've got ever-growing incisors, and they've got a lovely soft fur with a short tail. Um, on the left there is a, a young rabbit. On the right-hand side there is a hare. Uh, with its winter coat on. Uh, so, you know, hares, not as common in London. Rabbits, of course, do occur now and again. How common are they? Um, well, rabbits tend to be on the edges of outer London, where you've got pasture, heathland and grassland. Um, I talk a lot to other borough ecologists, and they've got the recorded northern land like um, Epping Forest, uh, Hounslow Heath and Trent Park. You know, you'll find rabbits out there. Where the ground is suitable for making burrows, if it's really soggy, wet, clear soil, you won't get rabbits. They need a nice, fairly well-drained soil. Some are escape pets as well. We know that, you know, people have had pet rabbits and they've got out and they think they've got pet rabbits in Hyde Park and Hampstead Heath, but they feel that most of them are escapees from someone's garden, <laughs> not uh, wild. Uh, the brown hares are uh, restricted to outer London. Um, there's some good populations on the edge of places like Hillingdon, Barnet and Bromley. But again, their numbers are quite small. And on the right hand side, there's a brown hare having a hop across the field. Um, the mustelids, I'll just mention here now, are the stoats and weasels, carnivorous, meat eating, very diverse. It includes the badgers, the otters, pine martins, polecats and ferrets. Small members of the stalks and weasels. The weasel is the smallest on the on the right there. They're very intelligent, wily and inquisitive. So if you see a stalk and weasel, they're often standing up, looking at you, finding out what you're doing. They are ferocious predators. They'll often attack, kill prey of greater body weight, like rabbits. And you can see on the right there, there's a weasel who's got hold of a rabbit. Um, uh, the razor sharp needle teeth with powerful jaw muscles. 
they'll lock onto and hold on the prey and they asphyxiate it because they, they throttle it with their powerful jaws. Very, very ferocious little predators. Are they common? Well, they are across London and more common. They seem to exploit an abundance of rodents like rats and mice, and of course, pet rabbits often succumb to them. There's been a lot of sightings in public parks. That one on the left-hand side is a, is a, is a weasel uh, attacking a green woodpecker in Hornchurch Country Park in Hebrew and uh, catching a ride. Well, not really, more like trying to bring the woodpecker down. And you can see that was one that's very famous um, picture seen in a lot of magazines. Um, Lambeth, we have had a record of one uh, weasel actually in Lambeth Palace. Uh, how it got there, no one knows, but it certainly did. So they do, they are distributed, but they're very elusive and hard to find. And just really to sort of summarise, because we're coming to the end, is I think the one thing to bear in mind about them is that they are often overlooked uh, and forgotten about. There are smaller relatives and quite small, um, but they're more common than we think. Um, they're very versatile and adaptive. They're exploiting the many opportunities around us to move around. They can find lots of shelter, find lots of food. They can breed ferociously and they colonize really well. Some are doing better than others. House mice are doing well, brown rats, grey squirrels, because we're giving them all the things that they want. Uh, I found the one in the picture at the top there of a house mouse sitting on a rat mouse trap, uh, basically making a mockery of the, the trap is quite funny. Others are struggling. Uh, hedgehogs and hazel dormice are classic examples. Um, bottom there you've got hazel dormice and their numbers are declining. And hedgehogs, we've heard some very sad stories about them. But I think also, um, I think they're linked to us. I mean, how they do is often because of what we're doing. They're linked to what we are doing, what we fail to do. We have to think we've removed and reduced or damaged their habitats. Uh, we've fragmented them up. Uh, a good example on the top there is a hedgehog. Uh, some people have put fences up in their gardens and they've fenced it so securely, poor hedgehogs can't get through from garden to garden. So they're forced onto the roads and that's where they come across with a car. So putting hedgehog gaps into your fence is a great way to help them. But we've actually put the barriers in to block them and make them struggle to find new territory. But of course, we've also given them um, new places to live and food to eat small mammals. Uh, we've made them also fitter through natural selection, including rodenticides. The bottom there, there's a big campaign to stop using rodenticides wantonly because all we're doing is we're building resistance in the vermin pests that we don't want. So it's really, you know, it, it's as very much the success is due to us. So it's a big balancing act. So really, I just wanted to finish there and say thank you for your time and interest. You've got the bat there, you've got the great red squirrel, you've got a field mouse, you've got a shrew, and you've got a weasel. And if you look around where you live around this part of London, keep an eye out for them. Um, they're far more common than you might imagine. But again, tell us all about the rarities as well. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Ian. That was really fascinating. Can I 